So after um, the talk I gave yesterday uh, for the BBC talk uh, about my experience in, um, in Taiwan, I thought, well, some people may have the question, why is it so important to give the bhikshuni ordination? What's the big deal? Why were you rejoicing so much and talking about it for a whole BBC talk? Um, the reason is because it's about keeping alive a, uh, a lifestyle and a possibility for practice that was begun by the enlightened one, the Buddha, and that has existed down to our day. And it's a very important lifestyle and an important way of practice, um, living as a monastic. And it's important for the individual and important for society. So in terms of the individual, um, well, first of all, before I start that, it's, um, we have to remember that the Buddha himself was a monastic. Okay, that's a very important piece of the p puzzle. The Buddha was not a lay, well, he started out as a lay person. And then when he, ha after he had the four um, messengers, then he cut off his hair. He left the lay life. He became uh, a wandering mendicant, a monk. And that's very important to remember, yeah? that he himself chose a particular lifestyle, uh, not only for himself, but for a, a, a good chunk of his followers. And he made that lifestyle possible and chose it for himself because he saw the benefits of it for the individual and for the society. So in terms of the individual, keeping the precepts, uh, you know, which is one element of taking ordination, um, allows us to purify our negative karma, abandon um, destructive habitual actions, and also to create a lot of merit, to simplify our life, to reduce distraction, to uh, steer our energy in a particular direction, and to live with other people who have that same uh, intention and that same goal. So it allows for, you know, us to just dedicate our life to the Dharma without a lot of other things going on in our life that take the time and energy away from us. Um, but, ev but just as, or even more important maybe, than the benefit ordination brings the individual is the benefit to society. You know, and to keep this uh, tradition going and affecting society in a, an important way. Because uh, a monastery and monastics, I see it very much as the conscience of society. You know, when people are making all sorts of public policies and so on, or acting in all sorts of different ways. Uh, we're kind of saying, hey, you know, it's possible to simplify life, to not crave so much, to reduce waste, to take care of the environment, to take care of the people who you live with, to, um, you know, to, to live in a totally different way. And so we... Uh, bring up those questions for society. You know, we bring up when they're talking about the death penalty, you know, because one of our precepts is not to kill. Why is uh, holding the, you know, advocating the death penalty something unethical and immoral? Okay? By the precepts we hold, we, we um, can advocate for uh, social policies that uphold the standards that are found in all religions. You know, not killing, not stealing, not lying, not misusing sexuality, and so on. Okay? And so it's important when there's a group of people upholding uh, ethical precepts, they're noticed by society much more than an individual here and an individual there 
is noticed. And also people know this is a place they can come for teachings, that when uh, they're distressed, they can come and uh, receive Dharma counseling, uh, so that we provide a lot of um, service to society free of charge. Okay, people can come here for retreats, they can, um, you know, live in a peaceful way. Of course, you have to follow a schedule. It's not just, you know, open house, uh, come live here and do what you want. But um, for the people who are interested, then, uh, you know, it's a place where they can learn how to cultivate love, compassion, joy, equanimity, wisdom, and so on. So uh, I think monasteries and monastics are a very important uh, thing for society in general, something that an individual cannot do themselves. And we see this by the amount of um, contact uh, we've been having with so many outside groups and how each year we get more and more requests to uh, speak in different places, to speak about different issues, uh, and to help people. Some of the people we don't even know, they just call us and ask for help. So then this has been really increasing. We can see that. So, uh, you know, sustaining this form of life and sustaining, uh, you know, monastic life in monasteries is something very important for the individuals and for society at large. So... Um, you might say then, well, you know, it's been going on for 25, 2600 years, you know, what's the, why do you have to make such a big effort to continue it? It's been going on for so long. Well, um, you know, we have had the opportunity to uh, adopt this lifestyle and live with the precepts. Uh, first, because the Buddha started the whole thing, Okay, he not only taught the Dharma, he taught the Vinaya. You know, it's very important that we remember this. It's not just the Dharma, it's the Vinaya, and the Vinaya sets the base for the Dharma practice in many ways. So the Buddha taught it. His immediate disciples uh, ordained more people, uh, established monasteries, and from generation to generation, there's people who have um, uh, what I call jumped on the wave of virtue, okay? So it's kind of like when you think of the monastic tradition, it's like this wave started, of, of virtue started with the Buddha, and, you know, it's going on, and it's the living people each generation who keep it alive. It's not the Buddha in the past, you know, it's the Buddha's inspiration, but Shakyamuni Buddha isn't here to keep it alive. It's not the, the ancient masters. They aren't here to keep it alive. We've got to do it, okay? And so they set it up for us, and we just kind of stepped in. We, you know, ordained and sat on top of that big wave of virtue, and now we've got to keep the wave of virtue going in the future so that more people can have access to it. You know, because it's really important for the individual, for society. Yeah. So that's why I was um, so inspired uh, at the ordination and why I think that going there was, uh, and learning how they do it and so on, was really, really important. I like your example of a wave. I, I have another example that parallels that, and that's we look at the old trees in the yard Mm -hmm. And none of the cells are older, none of the live cells are older than seven years old. Uh -huh. And so without those cells, that tree's a dead snag. Yeah. yeah. And those so, trees, will only, they won't be alive in, in 10 years. Yeah, you need the constant rejuvenation of the cells in the tree, the cells in our body, and the constant rejuvenation of, uh, we're like the cells in the Sangha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to keep the the whole uh, uh, the whole body going together, yeah, yeah. So we have a responsibility, and we also have a privilege, 
And His Holiness the Dalai Lama always talks about those two things as going together. Yeah. Um, you can't have the privilege without the responsibility. Okay. And the responsibility is what creates the cause to have the privilege now and the future and to uh, make it possible for other people. And so Venerable Jigme and I were talking a little bit about this before lunch and how this whole endeavor, uh, and especially in our case, to establish the Sangha in the West in a new country where it isn't established, um, how it's not about us at all. You know, this is not about you or me or any of us, uh, you know, being important or, or whatever. This is about maintaining uh, this, this virtuous wave and the possibility for people uh, in the future so they can benefit. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when we're ordained, we shouldn't think, you know, just, well, what's good for my, what my practice and what do I want to do and what don't I want to do and where do I want to live and what's the best situation for me? You know, that's not the way we should be thinking because we can't carry on uh, a 2,500 year tradition by thinking only of the small, our, the small details of our own personal situation. Yeah, we've got to have a very, very big mind and, uh, and you know, see the, the greatness of, of what the Buddha set up and make that available to other people. I was also thinking um, today or yesterday about um, the merit that both created the Abbey and our responsibility to continue to generate a lot of merit and all the people who come and how they contribute their merit too. But really thinking about how all the activities that we do here, all the offering service that we do is contributing to this great merit pile because it's not um, self-perpetuating without it. Um, so yeah. it's an important part of our responsibility, I think. Right. Yeah, it took a lot of merit on a lot of people's part to set up the Abbey. You know, sometimes people come and say to me, oh, thank you so much for what you've done. I didn't do this. I couldn't do this alone. This is not about me. You know, I don't have enough merit to create a monastery. This is about all of us. And it's about our lay supporters. And it's about all the, the people who come here for retreats and courses and all the online people who listen to the online teachings and, and so on. It's like this exists due to the participation and the merit of so many people. It's not just one person. It's not just a few people. Yeah, there's a lot of people involved. <laughs>